little while ago I did a teardown on an automatic uh, external defibrillator. Well, I spotted this one on eBay uh, really, really cheap, so I thought it might be interesting just to have a look at one from a different manufacturer just to see what things they've done differently. Obviously, you know, the, the two things are designed to do pretty much the same thing, but obviously different manufacturers would have taken different approaches to it. So um, let's take a quick look at this one. This is a Leardale Heart Start FR2. Um, this one does actually power up. We've actually got a battery for it. And it's got a big LCD on it, so it's much more of a user interface than the, the other one. Not really a great deal of interest on here. There's some logging um, review incident. It shows sort of how long it was turned on for, how many shocks it delivered. Um, bear in mind, this might, might have been a training run rather than a real, a real incident, so we don't know if this thing's actually been used um, in anger or not. Um, card for, there's actually a memory card in here for log, log information. It's a compact flash card um, in a little holder. I've had a look on it, there's nothing obvious on there but I think that's just for storing log log data there's also this thing's also got audio recording so you can actually record the audio so it's like a sort of post incident recording it's seems to have gone into a self test mode now um, there's a few things like again the device history so again how many times it's been used how many shocks it's been delivered training to uh, how many self tests again like the other one this does regular self tests of various functions including a sort of occasional full charge um, charge discharge internally um, setup. You can't actually change the setup, but what you can do is you can transfer setups from one unit to the other. This has got um, an IRDA port on it, so I'm guessing what you do is you, you do an initial setup on it with some PC software, or maybe the manufacturer does that, and then you can transfer the setups between um, units. But you can actually display the settings, so it's got volume, whether or not voice voice recording um, is enabled, whether it shows an ECG display, there's a few parameters related to the actual um, shock timing and everything and a few other various odds and ends uh, real time clock in there um, again nothing huge but if we run a self test it does actually say the previous one's failed and this one fails it might i don't know, I don't know it might be just because there's no electrodes with this but uh, i would have thought someone would have probably have tested it with the electrodes before um flogging it really cheaply on ebay and that's just doing like display test and it goes through and it will and say self test must pass before use, obviously it won't enable itself until it's passed the test self test. This is the test it does whenever you put a new battery in it. Make sure everything's working. And a couple of relay clicks. And it says it failed, so I've no idea why. Um one obvious difference in the other one, in, um, instead of a flip dot, it's using an LCD for the status display. Um, I'm guessing that, that red cross might actually be some prints on the back of it, because so, even when there's no power, you still get the red dot. So I'm guessing maybe something, a, a pattern obscures that when it's OK, and it shows the red cross when it's not. Right, let's turn the back off. Um, no sign of any shielding on the plastic, um, this casing. You can see there's this round round part of the casing which they used to put a single capacitor. This looks to me more like a film type cap rather than the electrolytics we saw on the other unit. And again, it, um, another difference is it's using a single capacitor. This is actually this is um, also a biphasic unit, so it does prov um, provide two different polarities of shock. So I'm going to assume there's some switching on here that that manages that and actually partially discharges the cap and then reverses the polarity and then does um, does discharge in the other direction. Um, these are the battery contacts, it's a smart battery, so it's lithium manganese dioxide non-rechargeable, 12 volts, 4.2 amp hours, so there's a retaining clip on there and there's some extra contacts so I'm sure there'll be some battery management type stuff going on there. And there's a few odd sort of plastic mouldings, that's the CF card, it's obviously the high voltage board on the top and then the logic board underneath. Right, so these are the connections to the electrodes. These go through here. I think if this is probably just a ferret core. They seem to be they seem to be very keen on their plastic mouldings. There's all sorts of little moulded pieces in here. <coughs> yeah, this is a ferrite core to um, probably mostly to prevent interference coupling from the uh, the electrodes back into the system. And these lead to go down to the bottom board. These are sort of fairly soft silicone, sort of high voltage electrodes. Another plastic moulding over here. This plastic just looks like it's sort of guiding the cables into the right place. Hmm. 
Right, this looks like some sort of module um, made by ICSIS. They specialise in things like high power MOSFETs and IGBTs and power semiconductors. And this might even be a custom module for this application to do the high voltage switching. Um, there's a relay there, some transformers down here, which I'm guessing are probably coupling, gate, gate coupling transformers to this module. Some big power resistors, some magnetics, this looks like a, an air cord inductor there, and that says ZMA and magnetics, again that's probably another inductor. And there's what look like some thin film resistors, these are probably voltage dividers for monitoring high voltage. Um, these are just a couple of fairly low voltage electrolytics and a few bits of, I'm guessing this is probably the front end of the um, the amplifier for the all the ECG functions so it may also be to do with the monitoring actually gets close to these resistors this cap is 105 microfarads, 21,000, sorry 2100 volts one little detail on this, you sometimes see this on capacitors and big transformers, there's no PCB. That means it doesn't contain any uh, chemicals known as poly polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, which were sort of quite nasty chemicals they used to use in quite old capacitors and also things like trans old transformer insulating oils. So this is just sort of to make, to, uh, make it clear that this, this capacitor doesn't contain any of those sort of uh, nasty, nasty chemicals. Interesting, although this thing's got Liardell written on the front and Philips Medical on the back, there's actually some other name here. You've got a Hewlett Packard logo and then Heartstream Inc. So I don't know whether this was maybe made sort of badged by Philips or maybe there were some company mergers going on, I don't know, but there's quite a variety of different names. Not very much on the back of this PCB, there's some um, surface mount sort of ceramic power resistors here. Um, this module does look like it's one sort of complete potted module. Um, some look like high voltage resistors down here with a cutout. There's quite a few bits of cutout on the PCB to increase the uh, creepage distance around here, all over the place. Looks like it's probably about a four layer board. Yeah, for example, here there's a track that's actually sandwiched on an inner layer. Little detail here, um, this part of the board, they've not only made a slot on the board, they've actually made this plastic cover go through the slot just to increase the creep creepage even more than it was before for just an additional safety. Oh, I've taken this module off, um, this looks like a sort of potted assembly, I think it might be a hybrid. Um, one thing I noticed, uh, some can be useful if you're trying to figure out whether something's potted or might actually be openable. Um, if you give it a squeeze it actually feels like there's a little bit of give in this plastic so I wonder if it's actually maybe a board that's just been back potted so um, I'll try and uh, open it up. Yeah, that's just been completely potted. I think the um, the give in that was just a pretty slight gap between the potting compound and the uh, top of the case. Oh, let's try another method. So you can see here there's uh, about six sort of large rectangular die in there and a few other bits and pieces. I don't know whether it's on a ceramic hybrid or a PCB, but it's probably just done as a done like that to make a sort of nice tested module, um, probably potted to avoid any clearance and creepage issues. I've just chipped the corner off and you can actually see it is white ceramic there, so this is a ceramic hybrid module. And here we've got some uh, more plastic, there's the microphone for the uh, built-in sort of incident recorder function. And there's a speaker here. And this looks like it's, uh, it's either a metal or a metalised plastic shielding cover. Yeah, it's metal, that's aluminium or possibly magnesium. Feels very light but quite hard. 
And of course every time we come across a piece of metal that we think might be magnesium, um, we do have to just check to make sure, don't we? And yes, I think that's, if not pure magnesium, got rather a lot of magnesium in it. And this looks like the front end for the uh, ECG stuff. We've got these multiple um, series combinations of high voltage resistors to keep all the nasty high voltage away from all the low level stuff. We've got a whole load of analog devices, chips, so these will be op amps, um, AC converters and the like. Uh, here we've got the main um, main processor area. This is it's a 68HC16Z. Um, some RAM, some flash ROM. Interesting here we've got a couple of chips that are actually marked with the name Heartstream, which is the same name on the uh, we've seen on the PCBs. It's down, down there as well, I think. Yeah, it's down there as well. So I don't know whether these are custom chips or just custom marked um, devices, but I mean, looking at the number of pins, yeah, there's an awful lot of pins on there. So, and I can't see any sort of oscillator on there. So, yeah, these are either, at least one of these may be a micro with, with, yeah, with custom code, or they could actually be full custom chips, but I can't really see why you would need a custom chip on a device like this. It's not really doing. Yeah, enough that you couldn't do with other um, normal parts, I wouldn't have thought. So I don't quite know what's going on there. Um, there's a chip that's got a label here that says glue, so I'm guessing that's a CPLD or something with glue logic, just soaking up all sorts of bits of random logic. That's um, yeah, Zydenx, uh, it's a little CPLD chip. Uh, there's a 12 meg oscillator down here. Compact flash socket. This will be um, power supply stuff down here. Nothing too exciting as uh, that's probably a real time clock crystal. Nothing hugely exciting really. And not much on the back, just a few odd sort of passives. Uh, the front panel buttons, the LEDs that light up that big button on the front. Again, this looks like it's probably four layer. And the display, this is just a standard, op, it looks like a probably off the shelf Hitachi um, graphic LCD module. They just put this rubber seal around it, it looks pretty bog standard, LED backlight there. Alright, this is that little LCD module, um, it's only got four pins on it, so uh, let's try sticking some signals up it and see what, see what it does. Well, I've just got a 100 hertz 5 volt signal. Um, here, so we'll just poke this around and see what the LCD does. So we've got, yeah, that, that obviously obscures it. There's like a, I don't know if it's an hourglass symbol or something similar. It looks like there's two separate segments on the side. Yeah, so we've got two segments on the side and something to obscure the cross. So, and although I like the flip dot, which drew zero power, a sort of static drive display like this is going to draw, you know, a couple of microamps or so if it's implemented properly. So on a battery of that size it's really not going to have any major impact on power and I suppose it has a slight advantage over the flip dot in that in theory if the flip dot was showing OK and then you completely lost power to the device the flip dot might actually still stay in the OK position whereas the LCD would always drop out back to the um, the cross position so this is just mounted in a little um, rubber housing bit other than that it's a pretty bog standard LCD assembly, assembly, obviously custom made for this application and that red cross would just be a print on the back so it's not not addressable, it's just uh, printed on the back side between the glass and the uh, rear polarizer. Um, this is the battery pack, it's pretty solidly um, welded together, my sort of normal method of cracking these welds didn't, doesn't seem to be uh, 
giving anything up. Um, I actually read somewhere online this uses CR123 camera batteries um, as a sort of proven reliable battery source. It says here um, installed before 03 2009 lithium manganese dioxide. Um, there's quite a few contacts on it. There's also another couple of contacts there which I guess might be for like programming or something. I think you might have to use a bit more uh, force to open this thing. And yes, they are actually literally stand bog standard Panasonic camera batteries. They've just been welded together into a pack. They've got some uh, diodes here, to, so they're not wiring them in parallel. So I suppose that that also gives sort of some redundancy as well. If you get one, yeah, you could actually have two batteries completely fail and still have and still get power. Um, there's just a thermal fuse here and uh, an overcurrent fuse. So a few interesting differences there. I think this is a more modern unit. They've sort of used more integrations, those custom chips and that hybrid switching module. Uh, in some ways it's sort of less educational in the, the, the previous one. It was actually quite easy to trace how all the high voltage circuitry worked, whereas this had been condensed down to that little hybrid module. Um, but obviously they've done that to reduce cost, increase reliability, because um, you know, this type of gear is probably made in pretty high volumes because they, you know, they have them at train stations. Um, public spaces for sort of semi-public use um, in emergency, so they've probably got more volume than say a traditional bit of um, pure medical equipment uh, might have. Um, but it's interesting to see just a few slight different approaches to the same problem, like for example the uh, indicator and so on, and also the fact that they've used sort of consumer batteries, um, which have proven to be long-term reliable, um, and they just sort of made up their own, their own uh, custom cell pack from them.